Sadness and outrage tonight after another school shooting in America. Good afternoon, this is News 2, and we're following a breaking story today of shooting at a high school in Littleton, Colorado. There is word potentially multiple children have been killed. This happened at the Robb Elementary School in the Uvalde Consolidated Independence School District. The 12th Colorado Movie Theater Massacre. Seven bodies were discovered in Oklahoma. Two mosques in Christchurch were targeted, the country's worst mass shooting ever. Here's the list of sources I used for this video. Patrick Henry Sherrill was born on November 13, 1941, in Watonga, Oklahoma. His parents were Charles Bennington Sherrill, 53, and Anna B. Weens, who was 33. He also had an older brother named Charles Lee Sherrill. Some sources claim he also had an older sister, but I wasn't able to find any more information about her. Not much is known about his life while he was a child, but it is reported that Cheryl was a fairly normal kid. His high school sports coaches remember Cheryl to be an earnest, quiet player who was a little shy. His teammates recall him as being strong, cocky, and determined. A fellow student and classmate, Nancy English said, quote, I remember him being a very big guy and kind of quiet, almost shy. By all accounts, he seemed to be a reserved but nevertheless normal kid growing up. There was never a mention of strange behavior in his younger years. Cheryl graduated from Harding High School in June of 1959. That fall, he enrolled at Oklahoma University on a wrestling scholarship. His college career didn't last long though, as he dropped out of school later that same year. Cheryl later went on to later join the US Marine Corps on January 15, 1964. While in the Marines, Cheryl was reported to qualify as an expert with an M14 rifle. He seemed to enjoy life in the Marines, but he did have the tendency to resent anyone who exercised authority over him. It was rumored that Cheryl served in Vietnam, but in reality, most of his time spent in the Marines was at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. Later, he was knocked down two ranks from expert to marksman because he did not requalify on the rifle range. Other than his firearms qualifications, Cheryl earned no medals, ribbons, or awards. After almost three years, on December 29, 1966, he received a general discharge under honorable conditions. After his time in the Marines, instead of pursuing a career, Cheryl enrolled at Edmonds Central State University in mid-1967, taking general education classes. He jumped from major to major, dropping courses if he didn't find them interesting. He consistently earned Ds and Fs. In the spring of 1970, he dropped out of college for the final time not earning a degree. Cheryl lived at home with his mother at this point, in Oklahoma City. He actively ignored his responsibilities and continued to put off getting a job. Eventually, he would work for short periods of time at various jobs, not sticking around for very long. From October 1974 to July 1975, Cheryl worked as an electronics technician and would repair the traffic lights all around Oklahoma City. His supervisor recalls, quote, he was a kind of eccentric person, kind of strange. After leaving his electronic technician job, Cheryl again spent time lounging around, operating his ham radio set. He met someone through his radio that was a member of the Oklahoma Air National Guard, who convinced Cheryl to visit the recruiting office. Cheryl would bicycle the 10 miles several times before he was finally accepted into the military unit in 1976. While in the Oklahoma Air National Guard he was a member of their marksmanship team, Cheryl had access to plenty of weapons, and it was from here that he later reportedly checked out the semi-automatic pistols and ammo that he would use in his attack in 1986. A woman who was a civilian employee remarks about interacting with Cheryl around this time. Later she said, quote, I just got the impression, you know, he's a weird guy. He always struck me as one of those men that, you know, peeped in windows and molested little kids. When asked what gave her that impression, she replied, quote, just his mannerisms, the way he would look. He's the first man in my life, and I have dealt with men all my life and worked with them, that I felt like I was nude standing there talking to him, or sitting there. She commented that she requested that her male associates not leave her alone in the building with him. By now, several people who had come into contact with adult Cheryl had begun to notice his strange personality. Around this time in his life, he was more of a loner, and although not having many, Cheryl did have a very few select friends. 
Cheryl began to work as a maintenance man at Tinker Air Force Base. I couldn't find very much information about this time in his life, or what he was doing, but he didn't last very long at this job position either, and in 1977, his mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Just a year later, in 1978, Cheryl's mother died, and he continued to occupy her home. He was dismissed at Tinker Air Force Base shortly after her death. He received a small income from her insurance, but Cheryl knew it would be necessary to once again get a job. He began to work at a radio store. He worked there for eight months before he suddenly quit. An older co-worker of Cheryl's referred to him as, quote, that young man, to a customer, which threw Cheryl into a fit. I have a given name, and it's Patrick Cheryl. He snapped out loud. He abruptly walked out of the store and never returned. Cheryl went on to have multiple other jobs, leaving each with no good reason. He had been hired by the Edmond Postal Service in 1982, but he resigned after only 89 days on the job. Cheryl still lived in his late mother's home. Many of his neighbors recall him being strange and hard to get along with. One neighbor, Louise Eastman, remembered seeing Cheryl strolling around at night, frequently walking up the homes with unshaded windows and taking a look inside. Eastman even had her own run-ins with Cheryl, catching him peeping into her windows on several occasions. Multiple neighbors started to notice this behavior and would regularly call police on him. Cheryl was never arrested for these creepy instances, though. They stated that he was only looking and wasn't exhibiting any violent behavior, so there really was no grounds to arrest him. In fact, Cheryl wasn't widely thought to be violent at all. Even the neighbors who caught him peeping said they didn't see anything in his personality that suggested violence. He quickly became known as Crazy Pat throughout the neighborhood, and the young kids in the area would often taunt him with this nickname. Many people who knew him would describe Cheryl as withdrawn, strange, and reclusive. Even with these traits, nobody had a clue to the terror that Cheryl would later be infamous for. Eventually, Cheryl decided to give Edmund USPS another try in April of 1985. He passed the written and physical exam needed to gain employment. He was never given a psychological exam. Cheryl was hired as a relief carrier. The role of a relief carrier was to work the alternate routes, on differing days. This meant that Cheryl was never permanently assigned to a specific route, which meant his role at the post office was not as stable as some of the other mail carriers. With his normal 40 hours a week, and some overtime, he likely earned about $13,000 in his first year. Initially, Cheryl's performance was satisfactory, but like most people in his life prior, his co-workers and supervisors found his personality strange, and barely anyone he worked with got along with him. Most everyone who worked at the Edmund Post Office considered their co-workers to be like family. Employees maintained a great relationship with one another, with exception to Cheryl. He was never known to engage in friendly conversation with his co-workers, and generally refused to be involved in any social situations with those around him. Cheryl would speak proudly about his position at the post office to the very few friends he had, but would also complain about some of the aspects at his job. He stated that he was unhappy with how he was treated there, and didn't enjoy the static work he would sometimes be assigned to. In October of 1985, Cheryl received a letter from one of his supervisors, Bill Bland, reprimanding him for his performance. Cheryl was suspended for seven calendar days due to this. The letter read, quote, On September 19, 1985, you did fail to protect mail entrusted to your care, as evidenced by the fact you left two trays of mail and three parcel post items unattended overnight at 601 Vista Lane. Your failure to discharge your assigned duties conscientiously and effectively resulted in a one-day delay in delivery of approximately 500 pieces of mail which had been entrusted to your care." Unquote. Five months later, Bland issued another letter to Cheryl, but this time it resulted in a 14-day suspension. That letter read, quote, On March 31, 1986, you acted in a very unprofessional manner by telling a customer that you did not need her help in finding the apartment mailboxes and did not care if the tenants received mail or not. The customer reported this incident and stated that you were very rude to her adding that she was only trying to help you find your way around the complex. You again acted in this manner. The customer reported by phone and by customer complaint form that you sprayed his dog with dog spray. The dog was behind a five-foot fence with a locked gate. When questioned about the incident, 
you admitted that you have walked past him many times in the past and were fully aware of the dog's presence behind the fence. You also stated that you had just received a new can of dog spray and were not sure it would work, but decided to use it on this dog anyway. You also asked the customer when questioned by him about the incident, if he wanted his mail delivered or not. This type of service seems consistent with your past performance evidenced by a suspension given you on October 2, 1985, and several discussions and a letter of warning. This type of behavior will not and cannot be tolerated. After these two incidents, Cheryl proclaimed to a friend that his supervisors were gathering any and all infractions, no matter how minor, in an effort to get rid of him. Most sources report Cheryl as being a less than desirable worker. Despite his probable mediocre performance and his previous track record of quitting without reasoning, he remained at this job for about a year and a half. On August 19, 1986, Patrick would be called in once again to speak to his supervisors, Bill Bland, and this time Richard Esser joined. The two voiced their concerns and complaints about Cheryl's performance. They hounded him about misdirected mail and also his lousy attendance. A few employees report seeing Cheryl in his supervisor's office, arguing with them. It wasn't apparent exactly what was being said, but it was clear that an argument was taking place. It was reported that during the talk between Cheryl and his supervisors, they threatened to dismiss him if his performance didn't improve. August 20, 1986 would mark the day of Cheryl's rampage. That morning, around 7 a.m., Cheryl, who was now 44, strolled into his workplace at 200 North Broadway through the employee parking lot in his usual uniform and also carrying his mailbag. He was armed with two M1911s, which are 45 caliber semi-automatic pistols, and a Ruger Mark II, 22 caliber semi-automatic pistol. More than 50 employees were busy doing their jobs that morning, unaware of Cheryl, who was secretly armed. Cheryl silently walked over to where his supervisor, Richard Esser, and another employee, Mike Rockney, were talking. Without saying a word, Cheryl drew his pistols from his mailbag and opened fire on both of them. Another employee, Mike Bigler recalled, quote, I was at my workstation. I heard some popping like firecrackers. I thought it was a practical joke to scare employees, so I kept working. My friend Mike Rockney was standing behind his own workstation. When the noise started, Bigler recalls that some of the people started to rush outside. Bigler says, quote, Mike Rockney fell to the floor, and I could see he was lying in a pool of blood. Esser also had fallen to the floor, and it was apparent that neither Esser nor Rockney were alive. After he realized what was going on, Bigler quickly ran to the exit. Quote, I was 50 or 60 feet from it and was shot in the back. I felt a stinging sensation. I just played dead. Cheryl kept walking around several times. He just went around shooting methodically, saying nothing. Some of the clerks were huddled in the post office box area. He went up to them and shot seven rounds and they were all screaming, says Bigler. A postal union supervisor, Larry Vercelli, said later, quote, He was in the center of the room with two 45 caliber pistols, blazing away. Some sources claim that Cheryl initially shot and killed an employee outside of the building before he entered that morning. But the majority of reports claim that he began his attack inside. Another employee, Daryl Fessler, was actively hiding after realizing what was happening. He says, quote, I heard a gunshot and hid behind some big boxes. I looked up and saw a man shooting a gun. He shot Mike Bigler and then just turned in a circle shooting at random. He went towards the front lobby shooting and we ran out of the back. He followed, still firing, and then returned inside. Still bleeding profusely, Bigler saw his opportunity to run as Cheryl disappeared from his view. He got up and quickly sprinted out of the back door. He made sure to put his hands over his head, in case the police were outside already. Bigler was worried that he would get shot again by police on accident, so he made sure to be in a surrendered pose when leaving the building. Many employees that were present during the initial gunshots were confused by the noise. Some who couldn't visibly see what was going on believed the pops were from firecrackers, but others assumed someone had dropped a few mail trays on the floor, causing the loud banging sounds. Larry Parrish later says, quote, I thought maybe it was a dry run practice to see how we'd react to a holdup, like a drill. I got under my workstation. Parrish asked a fellow employee what was going on, but she was also unaware of what was happening. A group of employees ran to the door which Cheryl had entered just moments before. Cheryl followed the panicked employees. He stepped out of the building and opened fire, 
sweeping the entire area in front of him. One of the escaped employees, Jerry Pyle, ran across the parking lot, attempting to seek shelter behind his car. He was soon struck by a bullet, and he dropped to the ground. He joined Esser and Rockney, being the third person to die that morning. Cheryl again made his way back into the building to continue his reign of terror. Hubert Hammond was still inside the building at this time. He says, quote, All of a sudden everyone panicked. At the time I was at station C-13. I took a step out to see what the confusion was. I saw Patrick Sherrill walking towards station C-9, where William Nimmo was at, and shot him twice. Then he turned toward me and lifted his gun at me but didn't shoot. By then I was running with my back to him, to the front office. As I got out, I heard a lot of shooting inside. Gene Black remembers multiple co-workers yelling for everyone to run and get out of there. He heard people screaming that someone had a gun. He began to run through the building, desperate to evade the flying bullets. Black later made a statement, quote, I ran to the superintendent's office on the north wall, slipping and almost falling as I turned to run up the aisle to the front. The doorway to the front counter appeared, and I told myself to jump. The counter looked as tall as the building itself. I sailed over the counter and crashed down on the other side, feeling other bodies moving with me. I got up and ran through the open double doors into the lobby. Frantically, I shoved open the first set of glass doors. They crashed against the outer doors as they swung back toward me. I ran outside, then down the front sidewalk to the public parking lot, running until I felt free of the building. I turned and saw Phil Crabtree and Larry Wilson half carrying, half dragging Bill Nimmo out the doors I had just run through. Nimmo was holding his side with his left hand, his legs doubled back underneath him. His blue shirt was red with blood, and his face showed the intense pain from his wound. According to some sources, Crabtree opened the back door of a car parked at the front of the building. Then they forced Nimmo's nearly limp body into the back seat of the car. Wilson quickly got into the car and sped out of the parking lot and disappeared behind the building as it drove away. Other sources claim that Wilson and Nimmo were driven to the hospital by a passing motorist. Wilson, who had carried out his bleeding co-worker and driven him away in a car, later recalled his time inside the building. I kicked the gun out of Pat's hand, but he recovered it and started shooting again, Wilson said. Miraculously, he was able to make it out alive that day. Diane Mason, who had seen the argument between Cheryl and his supervisors through the window, was startled by a loud bang. After hearing screams, she hid behind her mail tub. She says, quote, I was praying to God that when he got to me, he'd kill me quick. She heard the shots getting further away and took the opportunity to run through the front lobby doors. Cheryl passed his first two victims, making his way to the southwest sector, where he knew more employees would likely be. Clerks Nancy Limbecker and Becky Davis heard their supervisor Patty Husband yell for them to get down. Husband had been promoted just one month before. He quickly crouched in one of the bays, along with Betty Jarrett, who had been looking forward to her third wedding anniversary that was coming up. Thomas Shader was also with them, doing his best to hide in the small bays. Cheryl advanced towards the back corner where they were and turned to face the trio that were crouched together. Husband made one last plea, quote, No, Pat, no before gunshots rang out. Sadly, husband Jared and Shader were all shot and killed. Debbie Smith was also hiding nearby and watched as Cheryl walked past her. I saw him pass by with the gun and go to the next section. I heard him shoot and a woman scream. Miraculously, Cheryl had passed Smith's area, allowing her to make her escape after hearing the screams of the women in the section beside her. In the next section over, five women were huddling together, praying that Cheryl would not come seeking them out. Unfortunately, he did end up in their section and proceeded to empty his gun, shooting each and every one of them, all of them dying that day. The victims were Pat Chambers, who was married with two children, Judy Dunny, from Georgia, who had just begun to work at the Edmond Post Office four days prior. Her husband had moved their family to the safe town of Edmond after two people were killed at the Atlanta Main Post Office by a disgruntled worker, Stephen Brownlee. Patricia Gabbard was also amongst the five victims. She had only been working there for five months. Newlywed Patty Welch and Yona Gregard were also killed with the others. Peggy Gibson also narrowly avoided being killed that day. I saw a man with a gun. Gene Bray was between me and the gunman. He got shot and was laying on the floor. 
I hid under my workstation, she recalls. Gibson then made a dash for the back doors, which unfortunately were locked. She then quickly ran to the side door and was able to get out of the building. Richard Tompkins, after seeing Bray in a pool of blood, ran outside and across the parking lot to an apartment building to seek help. Unable to find anyone, he flagged down someone passing by on a motorcycle and asked for a ride to the police station. Cheryl then encountered Ken Morey, who was an upbeat and kind co-worker. Cheryl lifted the gun to Morey's head and ended his life only one month before his 50th birthday. Two employees were unable to get out of the building because of locked doors and had no other choice than to hide inside. They took shelter in a storage closet, but were unable to lock it from the inside. They switched the light off and just stayed as silent as they could. One of the employees, Tracy Sanchez, who was five months pregnant at the time, remembers hearing Cheryl walking around outside, continually emptying his weapon. Eventually it got quiet, but they stayed in the closet until they heard the police. Cheryl then made his way to the break room, where he had never joined in on any of the friendly conversations being held there during his employment. Halfway there, Cheryl encountered William Miller, who had just that morning been passing his wife's homemade cookies around to his fellow employees. Cheryl ended Miller's life without even batting an eye. Finally, he approached the break room and found Leroy Phillips. Phillips would join the precious 13 victims and die that day. He would be Cheryl's last kill. Outside, police and ambulances swarmed the streets and parking lots. Six people, including Jean Bray, Mike Bigler, Steve Vick, Judy Walker, Joyce Ingram, and William Nimmo, were all rushed to the hospital. Though some were in critical condition upon arriving, all six survived. Jean Black states, quote, I stood on the front sidewalk with a few other employees and watched as two policemen ran toward the post office. One positioned himself near the front door. The other ran to the southeast corner of the building near the loading docks, then dodged to the front of my mail truck. He crouched down and peered out. Jean Bray stumbled down the loading dock stairs, his uniform shirt covered in blood. He staggered about 30 feet from the steps, stumbled, and collapsed over a low brick wall on the south lawn. I rushed toward him at a dead run, desperate, wanting to help him. Others followed behind me, but the closer we got to his motionless body, the stronger my fear became that my friend was dying. The policeman crouched beside my mail truck, waved his hands and shouted, Get back! Get back! Four of my colleagues, friends, spurred by the need to help our wounded, possible dying buddy, paid no attention to the well-intentioned warning. We snatched Jean Bray's limp body from the blood-soaked lawn as if he were a small child. Hoisting him up, Mark Lumen, Phil Crabtree, Ken Lobdell and I ran for safety. We were not being heroic. We were damned scared for Jean. We carried him face down, the way we found him, each of us taking an arm or a leg. As we ran, I could see on his shirt the mass of blood from the wound in his back that now splattered on our uniforms. Finally reaching the front sidewalk again, we were met by two paramedics. We gently lowered our colleague to the concrete as the excited paramedics pushed us aside. Oh God, don't let Gene die, I said. Do something for him. The Edmond Police Department was swamped with frantic calls and screaming people running into the station. When police arrived, many people exclaimed that the shooter was Patrick Sherrill and multiple people had already been shot and likely killed inside the building. In the midst of chaos, people were running out of the building screaming, and there were also people still inside, desperate to escape. Police looked into the windows and noticed a man walking around inside. They saw him walk over to the back doors and peer out of the windows before disappearing from their view. Sometime between 7.15 a.m. and 7.20 a.m., police heard the sound of a single muffled gunshot, and after that, no movement was seen inside of the building. Shortly after, a SWAT team arrived and began trying to correspond with the shooter. They entered the building around 8.30 a.m. after no contact was established. The SWAT team reported that they had found the suspect deceased from an apparent suicide. Chaos continued to ensue outside. Victims were still injured and not being helped by medics. Bigler was laying on the ground, with no one tending to his wounds, Gene Black claims. He attempted to help as much as he could until more medics arrived and were able to take over. Black remembers standing across the street and watching helplessly as the horror wasn't over quite yet. 
The survivors were asked to gather at the nearby city council chambers. All of the employees' family members were also contacted and asked to meet. When everyone was gathered, a city official and his associates arrived. He requested everyone go back inside for a roll call. When I call out the names of the fatalities, I would like for their family members to please come to the front of the chambers. We have counselors available to talk with each one of you. Many people could only think of how insensitive this all was. One by one, each name was read aloud, and the wails of family members grew louder and louder. The cries howled through the building, and many families and friends had to be helped outside after collapsing on the floor. Seven men along with seven women died that day. Fourteen employees of the Edmund Post Office would never return to their families, never see another day, never have another happy moment, never be able to live out the rest of their life like they should have been able to. Six were critically wounded. The attack lasted 15 grueling minutes. 15 minutes of absolute terror that countless people had to endure. Those few minutes probably felt like hours during the panic felt by every single person in that building. Patrick Sherrill became the 15th fatality on August 20, 1986. Most people believe that Sherrill's true targets were the two supervisors who continuously reprimanded him. Richard Esser was unfortunately one of Sherrill's first victims, but luckily for Bill Bland, he had slept in that day, something that Bland had never done before. Because of this, he was never present at the massacre. Many of the employees were made to work the very next day, on August 21st, 1986. Most of the workers that were present during the attack opted to move to a different building, transfer to another job within the postal service, and some moved away. Sanchez, who was the one that hid in the storage closet, returned to work that day after having to fight herself to enter the building once again. She was diagnosed with PTSD in 1987 and quit her job at the post office in the 1990s. Sanchez remarks that July 4th was one of the worst days of the year. The firework pops brought her back to the horrific attack, and she would spend most of the night vomiting because of the repeated triggers. In 1987, a 7,000-page U.S. Postal Inspector's report broke down and analyzed the events of the Edmund tragedy. A one-day congressional hearing was held to allow the survivors and families a brief forum on March 18, 1987. It was concluded that more extensive measures should have been in place to screen Cheryl before he was hired. In 1989, the community of Edmond and the U.S. Postal Service placed a large memorial on the grounds of the Edmond Post Office. The monument cost around $92,000 to have it made and placed. Sculptor Richard Muno depicted a standing man and woman, who are both holding a yellow ribbon. Muno said that he was inspired by all of the yellow ribbon he saw tied around mailboxes, lampposts, and doorknobs after the tragedy. Fourteen small fountains surround the statues, each representing one of the fourteen victims. The names of all the victims are inscribed on a plaque that is also featured at the memorial. Sadly, today the memorial isn't looking its best. The bronze color of the statues has faded, and the base is riddled with countless cracks. The ribbon has since broken off of the statue and clangs as it bounces back and forth on windy days. Weeds also have overgrown around the memorial and continue to stay put. The survivors of the Edmund Post Office Massacre and their friends and family gathered outside of the post office on the 30th anniversary of the attack on August 20th, 2016. Thirty years had passed, but the wounds that everyone involved had were still fresh. It's always going to come back to you. It comes back to me all the time. I still have nightmares. And I guess I always will," said Jean Bray, 84, who had been shot during the attack 30 years prior. Carla Phillips, Leroy Phillips' wife, also attended the anniversary. She explains that she drove around the block several times before she was able to finally join the rest of the people gathered around the memorial. It brings back... It brings back old memories, Phillips said through tears. This attack inspired the American phrase, going postal. It continues to live on as America's deadliest workplace shooting. It is also the deadliest shooting by a lone gunman in the state of Oklahoma. Let's also think about those whose lives were forever changed when their friends or family members were killed. Thanks for sticking around until the end. Please let me know your thoughts about this case in the comments below. I hope you all were able to learn something new about this case from this video. 
I will catch you all in the next one. Stay safe. Peace.